Hi, my name's Carissa. My name's Rachel. And I'm Josh. And today we're gonna to be presenting on the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines through a geopolitical and strategic analysis of Southeast Asia. We're gonna use a series of case studies to understand differences in vaccine distribution strategies across countries. We'll walk through the context of each case study and problem space in each case study. We will then take these findings and apply them more broadly during the solutions part of the presentation. Ultimately, we will address limitations to these solutions and further research that may make the suggestions more widely applicable. Southeast Asia was chosen as a broadly applicable case study because of the broad array of countries that characterize the region. There is a wide range of GDP growth rates, a plausible proxy for development, and mortality rates from COVID-19, making the findings far-reaching. Additionally, COVID-19 has had a large impact on the region, which creates an interesting dichotomy. Governments may be more receptive to whichever vaccine is developed, independent of the manufacturer, but vaccine manufacturers may change public perception and acceptance of the, of the vaccine based on, among other things, past precedent or resistance support interference. Furthermore, there has been a well-researched recent history of epidemics within the region. Southeast Asia was severely impacted by both severe acute respiratory syndrome, also known as SARS, and influenza A virus subtype H1N1, also known as H1N1. Examination of the regional response to these epidemics will provide insight into cultural, political, and operational challenges present in the containment of these epidemics. This comparison will be useful in identifying similar challenges that may arise in the case of COVID-19 vaccine distribution. Additionally, many foreign players have interest in the region which could ultimately politicize vaccine distribution depending on the timeline of vaccine developments. In this project, Southeast Asia, which has investments from the U.S. in the form of foreign assistance, and China as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, will serve as a global thermometer for potential international political conflict surrounding vaccine development and distribution. Analysis of this region will allow us to determine potential barriers to vaccine distribution and highlight issues that may emerge within other comparable regions. More broadly, this could lead to recommendations that could be adopted by governments worldwide. I will now be discussing how we decided to define our scope of research and the problems that we had to consider. So we wanted to find representative case studies in our research. And one of the first things that we considered was the development level of the countries that we would be analyzing. We wanted there to be different development levels to represent the unique challenges that nations would be faced based on their different levels of development. And we based this analysis on GDP per capita. The country GDP per capita comparison based on CIA World Factbook data can be seen here in this graphic. Additionally, we also looked at regional viral history, which Carissa has touched on. And we also analyzed COVID-19 response domestically in all of the case studies. We wanted to have a nation that had a high infection rate of COVID-19, so the potential issues would be highlighted and governments would be inspired to implement policy solutions that could be observed. However, we also wanted to ensure that there was accurate data reporting on COVID-19 to get a full scope of the problems and lead to well-informed solutions. Based on this analysis, we chose Singapore as an example of a high level of development country, Philippines as a mid-tier development country, and Myanmar as the low level of development country. Additionally, when these case studies were chosen, these three nations were among the highest reported cases per million of COVID-19 in the region. Definitely muted. Uh, now we're gonna focus in on a uh, specific problem areas in each country for their individual vaccine distributions and uh, therefore hopefully provide you with a holistic overview of a variety of different challenges facing the region um, that we can then generalize to different contexts. Okay, so in thinking about the problems facing a, uh, a successful vaccine rollout, we identified four key overall areas. The first is gonna be domestic infrastructure, and this is gonna include topographical concerns and uh, remote regions and take into account the differences between those. Uh, for instance, the Philippines has over like 7,000 small islands and 110 million people. And Singapore is a city of 5 million people. Uh, secondly, then we're gonna to move to government policy. And this is again, thinking domestically and we're gonna consider regime type, uh, civil society and its strength and leadership quality. And then the geopolitical landscape. Um, and this is where we think uh, we kind of put our IR hats on and assess the geopolitical ramifications of vaccine relationships uh, regarding alliances, international organizations, uh, et cetera. And then finally, we're going to move to vaccine uh, safety and vaccine hesitancy. And this is going to discuss the public reluctance to vaccinate and uh, what can be done to mitigate that. 
Okay, so when looking at Myanmar, we found there to be four major issues that have emerged when considering the overall capacity of the nation to uh, mount an effective COVID-19 response. First of all is the infrastructural capacity. According to Dr. Kyai Khan Kong from the Ministry of Health in Myanmar, the nation has poor basic infrastructure, rough topography with certain villages only accessible via helicopter, lack of human resources leading to understaffed medical facilities and limited cold chain capacity, which is particularly important when considering that certain COVID-19 vaccines need to be refrigerated. In addition, Myanmar also has um, implemented late vaccine orders. So although they received the first order of Indian vaccines, there have been no plans made for a second order of approximately 1.5 million vaccines. So this reflects a lack of effective governance and also the issue of effective preventative measures. If the nation had mounted effective preventative measures, they wouldn't be in such a situation where they were pressed to get as many vaccines into the country as possible. The third point is current political turmoil, which has compounded the previous two issues. As of the 1st of February, there was a coup in the country and subsequently the medics in the country went on strike. And then the fourth point is geopolitical tensions, specifically focusing on vaccine friendship, which has also led to greater stress in relations surrounding Myanmar. Myanmar shares a border with both China and India, and China and Myanmar have been historically close, and this relationship has only grown stronger since the Rohingya crisis. Additionally, Myanmar and the United States, although they were previously getting closer to certain democratic reforms in Myanmar, the relationship has fractured due to the same Rohingya crisis. So there is a question of whether China and the United States would try to use vaccines in order to change their relationship with Myanmar. India does appear to be doing this by giving their vaccine gifts in order to potentially push back against China, highlighting the historic tensions between China and India. This reflects an ongoing problem of powerful states influence in the region and how that could impact vaccine distribution. Now I'm going to talk about Singapore and try to understand how the Singapore case study provides a different perspective in our analysis. Singapore's close relationship with opposing great powers provides an example of a case where one might expect geopolitics to come to head in vaccine distribution. So we're going to look at two major partners, China and the United States. China has also served the trade partnership. In 2017, Singapore's largest trade partner was China, and in one year alone, they invested $4.8 billion in the Chinese economy. This has engendered a mutual alliance between the two countries. There's also a cultural and geopolitical factor here. While economic codependence definitely drives relative importance, perhaps to equal note is that approximately 80% of Singapore's population, which is over 2 million people, are ethnic Chinese. This demographic breakdown makes Singapore the only country in Southeast Asia with an ethnic Chinese majority. So how does this relate to dosages given yeah, by China? The number of doses given to Singapore to date is on the higher end relative to neighboring countries in the Southeast Asian region. Importantly, Singapore's influence is not limited to China and thus has been successful in receiving vaccine doses from larger drug companies as well, which includes Pfizer and Moderna, both of which have published detailed clinical trial results with proven efficacy rates. In contrast, the lack of transparency in clinical trial data from the Sinovac vaccine has hurt public confidence in the Chinese vaccine. So, of the day here. The lack of faith in the Sinovac vaccine compared to the Pfizer and, Bi and Moderna vaccines poses potential issues for the distribution of the Sinovac vaccine in Singapore. Now moving over to the United States. In terms of economic ties from the U.S. and Singapore, there are over 4,200 American businesses in Singapore, leading to more than $180 billion invested in Singapore by American businesses. Additionally, the free trade agreement between the U.S. and Singapore supports more than 215,000 American jobs. Given the levels of cooperation between the US and the UK, with Singapore and Singapore's high level of coordination given the government structure, Singapore was able to receive shipments of the Pfizer and, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines relatively early in comparison to neighboring countries. As of December of 2020, Singapore was the first country in Asia to receive the Pfizer BioNTech COVID 19 vaccine. And since that initial rollout, Singapore has actually been able to negotiate additional contracts with Pfizer as well as with Moderna, coupling the dose supply with the promising clinical trial results. The question for the distribution of the Pfizer Moderna vaccines is really a function of dose allocation to optimize efficiency and efficacy rather than public confidence in, in the data. So regarding the Philippines, I want everyone to keep in mind two overall general dynamics. 
Uh, first, how the Philippines is similar to other Southeast Asian countries and then how it's different. Uh, so first to discuss the similarities, and this is the column on the right, this is um, geopolitics and statecraft in the geopolitical situation, uh, specifically regarding uh, China and the United States and the tensions that are felt from changing alliances. Uh, this is a dynamic that's felt throughout the region, uh, the political balancing act that's going on between shifting away from the United States or towards China or vice versa. Uh, so in the Philippines, this comes specifically with President Duterte um, and his leadership style. He ran on and championed a multi-billion dollar uh, infrastructure program to improve uh, the weak Filipino, Filipino infrastructure. And he's calling this his build, build, build program. And uh, there's one country in the region that really likes to help out smaller countries with multi-billion dollar infrastructure projects, uh, and that's China. And so Duterte is very clearly using vaccine delivery as well, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, to strengthen ties uh, with China. So briefly concerning the domestic political situation between Duterte and his constituency, uh, there is interestingly room for civil society and private businesses to act as counterweights against Duterte's policies. And the uh, uh, Philippines has an unusually strong civil society. Um, much of it, uh, the population is religious, 80% Catholic, 92% Christian, and Duterte is not religious. And high proportions of the population are actively involved in different faith-based community service projects. Um, and this could be utilized in, in vaccine delivery. Uh, moving on to the, the differences between the Philippines and the rest of the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, this is most notably seen in vaccine hesitancy, the, the public's uh, reluctance to vaccinate. And this stems most directly from a major event in 2016, um, as you can see, the Deng Baxia crisis, when the Filipino healthcare system's uh, public image was absolutely decimated uh, when the producer of this vaccine, uh, Deng Baxia, uh, which was a widely utilized vaccine against Deng fever, uh, raised some safety concerns regarding the dosages and the state-run media in the Philippines, as well as private sources, uh, launched massive disinformation campaigns that demonized uh, the healthcare sector in general, uh, as a result, vaccine rates plummeted across the board and previously inoculated against diseases like measles um, resurfaced in real outbreaks across the country. And what's important for us is that there's a really long lasting drop in conf confidence um, measured over the years. So in 2018, which is a year and change after the event, right, in 2016, there's still a 60% drop in confidence across multiple areas. So the percentage of those who are agreeing with uh, statements like, are vaccines safe? or are they effective or are they important? Uh, this decreased from over 90% to just above 30%, which is really a calamitous drop. Um, and in 2020, the Philippines has shown that they've got relatively low confidence rating in a COVID vaccine as well. 47% uh, say they would actively refuse a vaccine. And the top reasons are uh, safety concerns and potential side effects, which are clear carryovers from, from Deng Vaxia. Uh, notable as well is that it's uh, the, one of the concerns was country of origin. Uh, and that's a dig at China because the Philippines has been ordering almost exclusively um, Sinovac. And I'll discuss the, the relevant le lessons from this case study um, for COVID uh, in a later slide. So we're now going to use the research we presented to understand how we can actually apply this more broadly to a global application. At this point, our research has shown a very broad range of vaccine strategies employed with varying degrees of success. Now, perhaps the answer lies with rapid vaccination strategies where the goal is to maximize the number of people vaccinated. On the other hand, perhaps a more targeted approach is necessary where those that are of highest risk should be prioritized independent of the timeline. Using our analysis as a reference frame for suggestions, we will propose that countries with different capabilities should advocate for different strategies. For developed states, ordering many vaccines and focusing on rapid distribution makes more sense. For developing safe prevention would avoid the issue of vaccine hesitancy and infrastructural limitations, allowing time to order vaccines and distribute them. Importantly, we recognize that there are limitations to these solutions, namely differences in infrastructure, political ramifications, and vaccine hesitancy rates across nations will change the efficacy of the strategy proposed. To understand these limitations and mitigate challenges with strategy implementation, we will use the Philippines as a case study for how countries can combat vaccine hesitancy, and in doing so, promote public health more broadly. Ultimately, the findings from specific nations within Southeast Asia and the analysis of potential headwinds and implementation can be extended past Southeast Asia to a global setting. So before I spoke uh, broadly about great power conflict in the Philippines and now I'll dial down on COVID to pick out our first kind of key to success. And uh, we identified a central question which was characterizing the different geopolitical attitudes 
in the country's administrations, uh, and that's to collaborate or to compete. And President Duterte uh, in the Philippines clearly chose the compete option. As I said, he ordered vaccines almost exclusively from China, um, was constantly denigrating the international community for delays, and accused the West of being all about profit, profit, profit uh, in the vaccine game. He administered a dilemma to the United States early on in the crisis that if the US, as you can see there, fails to deliver um, these doses of vaccines, then they're not able to stay here anymore, uh, 20 million to be exact. And this is suggesting that he would terminate the longstanding visiting forces agreement, which is critical for limiting Chinese nuclear submarine access to deep water and is a pivotal part of the American security apparatus. Uh, the Philippines then actually temporarily withdrew from the visiting forces agreement in June of 2020. So. There's deep interplay um, in this compete option. Uh, on the other hand, Singapore and Vietnam, as we'll hear from shortly, uh, they chose a different path, uh, collaborate. This was characterized by stronger involvement with the international community, uh, specifically the COVAX project, and purchasing a more diverse vaccine cocktail. Uh, and so basically, instead of turning vaccines into a geopolitical tool, as the Philippines did, they considered them first and foremost in their capacity to save lives. Singapore was used as a case study for developed nations because of the high GDP per capita that's characteristic of the nation. You can see that reflected on the graph on the right hand side. So how should developed nations proceed with the COVID vaccine crisis? Countries with a centralized public health care system trusted by residents like that of Singapore should leverage this built out infrastructure to efficiently and effectively disseminate a vaccine. In fact, we talked to an expert named Michael Batikiotis, who's the Asia Regional Director for the Center of Human Humanitarian Dialogue. And you point to the fact that Singapore is an example of a picture perfect strategy implementer thus far, having already received high levels of doses of both Sinovac and Pfizer. Singapore's easy access to free vaccines and controlled strategy offers no room for error. Importantly, Singapore and Singapore, upwards of 80% of the population regularly visits or have visited a public medical institution. This signifies two things. One, a level of trust in public institutions, and two, the network of patient records that these institutions have. Countries with similar healthcare systems and high literacy rates can leverage this network created through interaction with these public medical facilities to distribute necessary information about the vaccine to the broader population. So now we'll be going into what strategy should be implemented by developing nations. And essentially what this is, is looking at what went wrong in the Philippines and Myanmar. So as we are conducting our research on Myanmar, the nation did undergo a coup and impact the analysis and drafting solutions. However, we decided to continue to include our research on Myanmar as we still felt that it highlights important issues developing states may face, such as a fear of great power conflict, late vaccine orders and infrastructural limitations, despite some of the local conditions being unique to Myanmar. In drafting our solutions, we decided to take um, a broader look at Southeast Asia, and that's what led us to Vietnam. So as you can see on this graphic here, Vietnam has one of the lowest COVID-19 cases per million in Southeast Asia. And based on this data and general global commendation towards Vietnam, we decided to further investigate Vietnam's COVID-19 strategy to develop our own proposal. So when Looking at development, developing nations, it's important to reiterate two persistent challenges that they seem to face. First of all, late orders of vaccines. And this reflects not only um, governance issues leading to vaccines being ordered late, but also as a reflection of supply chain problems as governments cannot deliver on their promised distribution timelines. The second issue, which sort of compounds the first issue is infrastructural limitations. So even if they get vaccines, there are consistently issues and effectively distribute the them throughout the country. So looking at this, we then analyzed Vietnam and found that it was very unique in Southeast Asia, given that it has been largely able to contain COVID-19. Its most east recent outbreak was on January 27th, and this accounted for one-fifth of the country's total COVID-19 cases. And that total as of February was only 1,981. So to sort of contextualize this, this is a country with a population of approximately 96 million. Additionally, the nation has one of the lowest death rates in all of Asia at only 35. And this is a low death rate compared to both developing and developed states. So based on their success, we use the national strategy of Vietnam to develop our own proposal for developing nations. 
Our pr proposal focuses on prevention over treatment and has two key facets, one being effective government policy and the second being large local compliance. So in terms of effective government policy, this includes strict lockdowns in outbreak areas, contact tracing with Vietnam health Vietnamese health officials have been referring to as third degree contact tracing and then also rigorous testing. So what this all means is that the whole nation doesn't need to go into lockdown and there can still be effective economic output as long as the virus outbreaks are contained to relatively small areas and this is proven to be wildly effective in Vietnam. The second facet that is key to this policy success is large local compliance. This is a publicly driven effort with large public solidarity with regions in lockdown. And then also what was found to be very effective in Vietnam was tapping into cultural aspects of compliance that already existed. So in the case of Vietnam, there's general hospital phobia where locals don't want to go to local hospitals. And so the government sort of tapped into this good fear by saying, okay, if you don't wanna to go to the hospital, then don't get sick in the first place. Don't let your friends or family members get sick. And this is proven to be highly effective in making sure that local, there's large local support for government policies. So this then has meant that Vietnam's vaccination strategy has a lot more flexibility compared to other states in the region. There's no urgent need to vaccinate the population because the population isn't sick. Additionally, they've been able to order mixed sources of um, vaccines such as COVAX and AstraZeneca. And so again, to reiterate, this method leads to much more flexibility in vaccine strategies. Um, it can account for geopolitics because vaccines come from many different sources. So this preserves the autonomy of developing nations as they're not overly reliant on one source. It means that late orders aren't as dire and infrastructural limitations can be worked around. So all in all, this would allow developing nations not to be on the same timeline as states where there isn't effective prevention in place. All right, now we're gonna go into some brief limitations um, and talk about vaccine hesitancy and then wrap up. So um, quickly, I guess the, the one of the first limitations that we identified to the kind of the findings of our study is that uh, the question of timelines. So with the rapid fire developments in, in COVID and, and changing international healthcare demands, uh, we're wondering how countries will balance sticking to one vaccine strategy and seeing it all the way through versus kind of staying flexible and adaptive to the situation and whatever recommendations we make. Uh, the second issue that we kind of identified was deep seated cultural differences. So one of the things that you heard from, just heard Rachel talk about was uh, strong civil societies. I'm gonna speak about that in the Philippines as well. And we identified that as critical for successful rollouts. Uh, and it's beyond the scope of our project though to recommend engineering widespread improvements in civil society or in national culture in developing these attitudes of shared communal and public uh, accountability. Uh, finally, regarding geopolitical ramifications, um, we're wondering whether providers are laying the groundwork for future political leveraging. And this is really gonna depend on who you ask. The US is certainly going to say that, um, yes, you know, China is moving forward with their predatory loan strategy as always, uh, but we can't answer that now, only time will tell. One area that we can definitely more concretely observe is vaccine hesitancy and make some really direct recommendations. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna speak about now. So uh, regarding vaccine hesitancy, I'm gonna give now some really specific recommendations for combating um, anti-vaccine cultural stigma. And these are the lessons that I'm gonna pull from Dingvaxia uh, for COVID. So, First, to, to redefine hesitancy is this reluctance to get vaccinated or cooperate with uh, government-run healthcare sectors. And uh, one of the, the major themes here that I want you to keep in mind is that there is kind of a parallel going on between 2016 and 2020 regarding politi politicization of, uh, of the vaccine and also of uh, disinformation campaigns. So in 2016, there were basically two major disinformation hotspots going on in the world. One of them is more obvious, the Trump-Clinton election and uh, the Filipino presidential election, slightly less obvious. Uh, but in the Philippines, just like in America, social media was weaponized for political gain. Uh, and the difference was that instead of emails being an issue, uh, vaccines took center stage, uh, namely outgoing uh, President Benigno Aquino's uh, Dingvaxia failure. And in the Trump and Biden election in 2020, we saw disinformation again take center stage with the use of social media being a hotly debated topic. Uh, one question that experts are worried about um, is whether vaccine rollouts in 2020 assuming uh, seeing how there's a, a rapidly approaching uh, Filipino election as well, 
uh, experts are worried that Duterte and other political bodies will again turn to disinformation to leverage the COVID vaccine for a political gain, as they did with the uh, Dengvaxia vaccine in, in 2016. Uh, so basically, how will 2016 strategies be deployed in 2020? And we saw this played out in the US context, uh, and it was worrisome. So how's it going to work out in the Philippines? So, uh, so far, I guess, in answering that question, we haven't really seen outright domestic leveraging by the administration in withholding vaccinations or slowing the process uh, deliberately. Instead, it's actually been a pretty great uh, social media usage by the Department of Health. They've been engaging the public with a variety of resources on Facebook, holding multiple three to four hour town halls with expert presentations. Uh, they released many short informational videos on the vaccine explaining different parts of it and uh, even created like really more more interesting and creative means uh, like a pro vaccine music video. Um, finally, one area that we've seen some potential politicization, um, which is potentially problematic, is in the administration's pushing uh, Sinovac. So the Filipino Department of Health has spent significant time in these town halls and also in these informational videos uh, defending China's vaccine, specifically its efficacy, its safety, and its importance. And this clearly reflects Duterte's uh, geopolitical uh, preferences, right? But other than that, uh, two conclusions from the paper that um, I hope you got a chance to see. Um, most critical, the, the general theme that unites them is, is taking the public into account. Uh, while the leadership may like China uh, in, in the Philippines, Duterte is definitely uh, a big, big adherent. Filipino public opinion tilts overwhelmingly towards the United States. Most Filipinos really don't trust China for infrastructure assistance, uh, security, or vaccinations. This is by confirmed by multiple public opinion polls. And uh, the second you know, major idea that we took out of this is not forcing communities to trust healthcare workers, but gauging public acceptance first and working bottom up within what people feel comfortable with. Um, that's kind of necessary to reduce hesitancy. So the political relationship between the leader and then the constituency really matters. So in terms of future research, we wanted to highlight three um, potential areas that we think that experts should focus on that we haven't had a chance to really analyze because this is an un currently unfolding issue. So first would be changes in national policy for vaccine providers. The second being relations between states with different vaccination levels. And the third being economic recovery policies as nations move away from the current humanitarian crisis and towards ensuring their economies get back on track. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation. Please let us know if you have any questions.